All right, well, thanks, Hope. Uh, and good morning, everyone, and thanks for allowing me to present today. I'm very excited to be able to share with you some information regarding the importance of menus, specifically strategies behind how your menu is set up and priced in order to make them most profitable. Uh, so like Hope said, my name is Lauren Slodewick. I'm a business solutions specialist for Gordon Food Service based in Pittsburgh. Uh, and a business solutions specialist or a BSS is really just, I guess, a fancy way for how we say a consultant. So uh, I spend time with my sales reps, my customers, work on menus, do staff training, uh, help them find the right technology, things like that. Uh, I started at Gordon Food Service in 2014. Uh, I spent about eight years in sales, and then I just transferred into the role I have now about a year ago. Uh, before I came to GFS, I served in a variety of different management roles in the food service industry. Most recently, I was the GM uh, for a multi-unit bakery located here in Pittsburgh. Uh, I went to Penn State. I graduated in 2008. And like I said, I now live right in the city uh, with my husband and my two dogs. So this is uh, the agenda that we're going to cover, cover today. So we're, first, we're going to touch on why the menu and why we're focusing on it now. Different types of menus, uh, menu analysis and engineering, uh, your menu mix, menu design, pricing strategies, next steps, and some additional resources. So why the menu and why are we focusing on it now? More important than ever, post-COVID with staffing issues and increased food costs, 75% of operators say that recruiting and retaining talent is their number one priority. With staff turning over at a rapid pace, ensuring that your menu is easy to execute and easy to train on is a must. 96% of operators have reported that they have supply chain challenges. I'm assuming the other 4% didn't understand the question. Smaller menus allow you to ensure that you can source all the items that you need Focus on items that are available and lean in on your distribution sales rep in order to pick products that are sustainable. Wholesale inflation rose to 17.29% in May of 2022 over the prior year. This is one of the primary reasons you need to ensure that your menu is priced correctly and your items are profitable. For these reasons, amongst others, 60% of restaurants have reduced the size of their core menu. Your menu and the items on it set the stage for how your restaurant operates. Uh, the items on your menu determine the skill set that your staff needs. Uh, that then ties into the amount of training and the level of training you need to provide to your staff. With higher turnover, limiting the skills needed to execute could be beneficial. Are the items on your menu easy to execute? Are they repeatable? And do you have solid recipes uh, and procedures in place? Is all of your product being cross-utilized? Are you carrying too many items? Is too much of your food cost sitting on a shelf just waiting for someone to order it? And efficiency right now is huge if you have a limited staff. Build your own sections can really hinder your kitchen flow. The same goes for having too many menu items in general. It causes the line to have to pivot in too many directions. There are three main types of menus. So your core menu obviously is your main menu and this should be limited to 30 or 40 items at most. It should be really easy for your customers to navigate. The core menu should have a look and feel that really showcases your brand. And one third of customers are likely to order the first thing they see. So make sure that the menu encourages them to order the items that you want them to buy. LTOs or limited time offers are Diners are looking for limited time offers, especially if they feature in-season items. So think pumpkin spice lattes. Uh, LTO items should increase your check averages. So focus on additions to regular menu items, such as appetizers, desserts, and drinks. They encourage repeat business as customers are expecting new things uh, and are excited to see what new items will become available. And they should take advantage of seasonality because often when things are in season, uh, their costs are, are decreased. Specials do not mean discounts. Specials mean special. So they're very flexible. They do not have to be for any determined, you know, predetermined amount of time. It could be for a set number of meals until you run out, etc. Focus on items that you need to move out of the kitchen. Make sure your staff can speak to them and sell them. And for LTOs and specials, you have to make sure that you're advertising them. So this is a good time to be posting things on social media so that people know that you're featuring something different to get people to come in. 
We'll discuss the process of menu engineering here in a moment, but first let's look at the value of what we're gonna go over. So only 10% of restaurants do a good thorough menu analysis on a regular basis. 30% of restaurants do a so-so job of it and 60% of restaurants do not do this process at all. By following the process, you have an opportunity to increase your profits by 10 to 15%. So what information do we need in order to run a thorough and successful menu analysis? First, you need to know your food cost per menu item. This is how much money is spent on each ingredient of each dish. And this includes delivery fees, packaging, and other expenses associated with the plate cost. You'll then need to figure out your food cost percentage, which is your food cost uh, divided by the selling price. It gives you an understanding of your menu's profitability. And it's better to have your food cost broken down by each item versus each category or by your overall food cost for the entire restaurant menu. And of course, the industry standard is between 28 and 35%. Last, and I think this is where people don't spend enough time thinking about, but where we've pushed customers towards lately, is the contribution margin, which is the net dollars taken to the bank or your profitability. It's the cornerstone of menu engineering, and it can be calculated per portion or as total profit of your entire menu. The equation for this is the total revenue from sales minus your total food costs. So once you've calculated your menu's food cost and profitability, the next is to pull, I'm sorry, is to pull a product mix from your point of sale. And this will tell you how much of each item that you've sold. Run the report for the length of time you want to have between menu analysis. So four, six months or a year, depending on how often you wanna go through this process. Once we look at sales and profitability of each item, we'll break them down into four categories, stars, puzzles, plow horses, and dogs. And we'll dig into these here in a few slides. So as much stars um, are exactly that, they're the star of your menu. Uh, they sell on their own. We don't need to call them out. We don't need to put them in any particular spot on the menu. We don't need to advertise them. Uh, you can place them in the second or the last uh, menu category, or I'm sorry, section of each menu category, because again, people are going to find them whether we're drawing attention to them or not. Puzzles are high profit, but have low popularity. We should put those items in the sweet spot, also known as the first item in each category. Maybe we want to improve the item description to try to draw more attention to them. Maybe we take them off the menu for a little bit and run them as an LTO or a special to try to drive up uh, interest in that item. Or you could even start a contest with your staff to see who could sell the most of them. Plow horses are the most dangerous category of the menu. They are low profit, but high popularity. Uh, so think probably, especially during COVID, chicken wings. Uh, the, the first thing to try with those items, obviously, is to increase the menu price. So see if, if you increase the price of them, if you still continue to sell a lot. Maybe we offer them as a strategic pairing. So, you know, running a beer special with wig night in order to increase uh, profitability on that. Or we just plan accordingly when we're doing the menu. So we kind of hide them or bury them at the bottom of a category, at the bottom of the menu. If they're an item that we really need to keep on the menu, just make it not as obvious. Or maybe we swap an ingredient or do some other, you know, things to bring the cost down. The last section are dogs and they're low profit and low popularity. So maybe they just need a little facelift. Maybe we need to rebrand or reinvent that item. Maybe we need to move it off the menu again. Maybe it's more seasonal. So maybe you're not selling a lot of chili in this summer. So maybe we pull that off and just pull it back on uh, when it's winter again. Maybe we just need that item to go away. If it's low profit and low popularity, maybe you have an emotional attachment to it, um, but it's not really doing you any favors. And if you absolutely need to keep it on the menu for some reason, again, we'll just be strategic on where we place it. Your menu is the number one marketing tool for the restaurant. So it's important that it represents your establishment and stays on brand at all times. Consider your fonts, your colors, the voice and tone of the menu to make sure that all matches your brand. The larger your menu, the longer it takes your guests to decide what they want to order. 
guests tend to only be able to remember or focus on about seven items at a time. So keep your categories limited, limited with about six to eight items. Long menus work best for quick service or diner-like restaurants. Otherwise, more and more establishments are moving towards smaller, more curated menus. Keep in mind, studies show that 80% of your sales come from just 20% of your menu. To ensure your menu is a lean, mean profit machine, consider having separate menus for different day parts. This allows you to play with pricing without guests comparing prices. So if you have a lunch menu or dinner menu and the items on it are somewhat similar, keep those separate so that customers aren't trying to order the cheaper item at dinner or you know, commenting on the fact that it's cheaper at lunch. Keep des dessert and drink menus separate and on the table if possible, because that will keep the guests looking at it during their, their meals and it will help increase check averages and increase tips. Semantic salience is how noticeable and more important a symbol's meaning is to a situation. So yes, we want to make sure that your menu is profitable, but when costing out an item, do we want it to end in 0 0.99, 0 0.95, 0 0.00, or just be a whole number? And what's the deal with dollar signs? In 2009, the Baltimore Sun did a study at St. Andrew's Cafe at the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park. They wanted to take a look at spending habits for diners. Originally, they thought if they wrote out the pricing, customers would spend more money. However, when they removed the currency completely from the menu, the check average started to go up. A similar study was also done at Cornell and it found similar results. For decibels, it really depends on your establishment. So written out or ending in 0, .00 can often come across as stuffy uh, and that's often seen in fine dining. Prices that end in 0.99 come across as a little bit cheap, uh, which is, we see those more in fast food restaurants. And 0.95 portrays friendliness and familiarity, and is often seen at family dining establishments. Whatever your strategy you choose, just make sure that it's consistent across your menu. Several years ago, Gallup re released a study that found that an average customer spends 109 seconds reading a menu. Their eyes would go directly to the center, then to the top right, over to the top left, and down to the bottom right, giving us the golden triangle. In those 109 seconds, a restaurant needs to grab the guest's attention and sway their decision towards a profitable item. When you design your menu, try and place your most profitable category in the center. This is where the categories we talked about earlier come in. So the dogs, the stars, the plow horses, et cetera. Sometimes it won't make sense to put a specific category in the middle. In that case, utilize lines and boxes and things to draw people's attention around the menu. Highlighting items by boxing them in is a great way to bring focus to profitable items. Boxing in puzzles can help them make them stars, and it helps draw attention away from plow horses and potential dogs. There's always a, also a hot <laughs> debate around descriptions. Should you just list the ingredients? Do you call out local businesses? Do you tell a story? Descriptors help diners decide what they want to order, but keep in mind they make their decision in 109 seconds. If your menu is bogged down by lengthy descriptions, it may, people may get frustrated and just pick something safe and familiar instead of something profitable. So use and use all of the senses when you're describing your menu items. So what's next? Well, start by assessing the following. First, do you have recipes built? Are they accurate? Many times when I ask a customer this question, I get a yes, obviously, of course I do. But when we really dig into it, they're not really as accurate as we may have thought. The number of times a customer tells me that a side of French fries equals one handful, uh, a handful is really hard to measure and you can't cost a handful of French fries out. Are you able to pull a P-mix from your point of sale? And does your point of sale even have a menu analysis tool built into it? So some more updated point of sale services uh, systems do have menu analysis tools built in where you may input the, your food cost, they know your sales and it would spit out a menu analysis. Again, we need to decide how often we want to run a menu analysis and then what do we do with that information? And is, is the final result then that you're gonna redesign the menu? Is it time to re-engineer to ensure that the menu is profitable and making sure the right items are being sold. Does your design fit your establishment 
And do you need to do away with dollar signs or the beloved dot, 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 dot that leads all the way to the right hand side where all the prices are lined up in a row so customers can just pick the. The chart and the graph below are an example that we can use to understand this process. We can easily see that the it what items are most popular, what have the lowest food cost percentage, and which have the highest margins. A true menu analysis takes this data and then plots it on a graph, which you can see on the right. This allows you to make decisions by placing each menu into one of the categories we talked about. So dogs, stars, puzzles, and plow horses. This can be done by hand, but technology has really been a game changer when it comes to being able to properly analyze uh, your menu regularly. So here's just an example of a menu that our team recently did utilizing data garnished by a menu analysis. So on the old menu, you'll see that quesadillas and fajitas are buried at the bottom of a very, very long category. But these items were both puzzles, meaning they were really profitable, but just not very popular. When we redid their menu, we moved the items into a spot that's more likely to be noticed to catch a customer's attention and obviously then get ordered. For this customer specifically, pretzels and hot pepper cheese balls were both plow horses, meaning customers were gonna order them no matter where we put them. So we put them closer to the bottom of the menu. We didn't highlight them. We didn't need to draw the map or eye to them. Customers are gonna find them regardless. So at Gordon Food Service, we have a few programs that we use uh, that we offer to customers to allow them to get a grasp of their food costs and menu profitability. So first and foremost, uh, something you, you guys could all get on right now is called Back of House, and that's a website. It's backofhouse.io. This is a one-stop shop for restaurant tech. Uh, you can search for any services that you might be looking for, uh, and the site will bring up a list of vetted third-party programs that fit the bill. Each service has user-generated reviews and ratings. You can subscribe for industry insights that keep you up to date. And again, this list is all, like no one pays to get to the top of it. Um, it's all user-generated based on reviews and pushing them towards the top of the list. Gordon Restaurant Pro and Gordon Culinary Pro are both services that you could find on Back of House. So Gordon Restaurant Pro is uh, powered by a program called Margin Edge. Uh, Margin Edge is something that is available to anyone. It inputs, imports sales and purchase data sale and pools information from your distributors. And it does that electronically behind the scenes. You can export invoices and journal entries to your accounting software. Uh, it provides real-time actionable data, real-time recipe costing, a daily P&L, uh, you can do actual live inventory. You can compare theoretical versus actual inventory costs. Uh, you can create budgets uh, and use it to track costs such as, you know, unexpected things like repairs and maintenance. You can also do an on-demand menu analysis. So all of the steps we just talked about, uh, you can actually see that in real time at, at any point. So it knows all of your sales. It knows all of your costs. So it can break things into those four categories at, at any time. Uh, Gordon Culinary Pro is powered by a software called Mies, which again is a third-party software that any of you guys could get right now. Uh, you can create or upload recipes. It again pulls data from invoices and costing. Uh, you can share photos, videos, and step-by-step -step instructions to help create training material for your teams. You can really easily scale recipes. So if you need to, if you have a catering, it's really easy to produce, you know, 20 of this cert, uh, you know, recipe uh, and it creates like a shopping list for you. It automates allergen information and it links nutritional information. I'll say the big difference between Mies and Margin Edge is that they don't, uh, Mies doesn't integrate with your point of sale. So it doesn't pull your sales data, but you can still use this information. So your food cost to then run your own menu analysis. So really, that, that I mean, that's what I have for you guys today. Uh, here's some content information for me. Again, it's Lauren Slodwick. Uh, you can also go online and see us at gfs.com. Or like I said, backofhouse.io is a phenomenal resource for any of you. And there's also uh, some links here as well so that you can do uh, demos for either of those programs. So hope I can 
turn it over to you for questions. Thank you, Lauren. That was great. Um, such awesome information. Does anybody, if anybody has any questions, we have a small group. If you want to unmute yourself, you can ask the question or go into the chat. Uh, we will be sharing this recording and, um, you know, all of Lauren's information. So if you have more questions, you don't feel comfortable asking today, I totally understand. Um, but does anybody have any questions? Great information. I appreciate you taking the time today. Oh, thanks, Hope. I would put my video on, but it tells me the host is not allowing me to put my video on, just so you know. <laughs> so that's why I'm a, I'm, I'm not on. But uh, well, it doesn't look like we have any questions, Lauren. It was so um, you were so thorough. Everybody's just <laughs> contemplating the information. We'll get this information out to everyone, and then if you have more questions, you can reach out to Lauren. But we really appreciate Gordon Food Service and your partnership with us with ProStart and with us as the PRLA and all your support. Um, it's very, it's really nice to have good partners like you. Okay, well, thanks for having me today. All right, well, thank you. And I hope everybody has a wonderful day.